in the absence of our pastor this morning. In the absence of our pastor this morning. <laughs> there is a preacher in the house. And, and when, when I, I say, say a preacher, preacher I, mean I mean a preacher, preacher in the house. house. Reverend, Reverend Glenice Daniel Chambers is, is our special guest today. today. Amen. Amen. And, and Reverend Glenice Daniel Chambers, Chambers is, proud, is a proud native of Richmond, Virginia. Virginia of its Churchill area. Reverend, Reverend Daniel, Daniel Chambers received her undergraduate degree from James Madison University. She holds two master's degree, one from Central Michigan University and the other as a 2017 graduate of the Samuel DeWitt Proctor School of Theology at Virginia Union University. Reverend Daniel Chambers has been a faithful member of the St. Paul's Baptist Church for more than 25 years. Reverend Dan Daniel Chambers is a lifetime and active member of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated and the current president of the Pi Rho Omega chapter of the sorority located in Chesterfield County. She has been employed for more than 35 years with the Defense Logistics Agency. She's married to her biggest supporter and the love of her life, Donald Chambers, who serves as chairman of the, of the diaconate at the St. Paul's Baptist Church. They have two adult sons, Montello and Donovan Chambers. God, in God's infinite wisdom, blessed her and her husband with additional children in the latter phase, in the later phase of life. And they are the proud parents of their first daughter, six-year-old Jasmine, and son number three, 10-year-old Jermaine. <sighs> yeah, somebody say hallelujah. <laughs> Glory. One of her favorite scriptures is Jeremiah 29, 11. Very familiar passage. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. Amen, amen, amen. And it didn't say so in her bio. But Reverend Glenice is not a stranger here at Second Baptist. Not a stranger. She spent some time here with us. Amen? Working in the vineyard. The next voice that you hear shall be that of my friend, our friend, Reverend. Glennis Johnson. Amen. Praise the Lord, somebody. He did so well until the end, didn't he? Give him a hand clap of praise. We're so excited. Hallelujah. I am not um, a guest, that's for sure. I'm special in some way, but I'm not a special guest, OK? So I appreciate that. Um, uh, for those of you who remember, I did. I had some training time here at, at the Second Baptist Church. So a lot of the faces look familiar, and it's just good to be back. So good morning, Saint, good morning, Second Baptist, and happy Palm Sunday. First giving honor and praise and glory to God the Father, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, and the precious, precious Holy Spirit, who is the great comforter and intercessor. I want, I want to, to thank, thank Pastor Hodge and Lady Hodge for this opportunity to stand before this sacred desk this morning. And good morning to all the officers, deacons, trustees, and members of this great branch of Zion. Again, it's good to be back with you. I'd also like to acknowledge again my husband, Donald Chambers, who serves as the chairman of the diaconate ministry at St. Paul's Baptist Church. Baby, why don't you stand up so they know who you are? Listen, listen, listen. I got to say thank you to Brother Jake and this choir. Y'all have set the atmosphere. Your sister is ready to preach because y'all did what God gave y'all to do. So thank you, thank you, thank you. 
Every song hit a good spot, so I'm appreciative, so I'm ready. There is a word for this church this morning, so if you can and if you will, why don't you stand up with me as I read from the NIV version. I'm coming out of the NIV version, James 1, 2 through 4. The book of James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4. Here's the word of the Lord. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish its good work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. The title of this message this morning is Joy in the Test. Joy in the Test. Let us pray. Good and gracious God, we come before you with thanksgiving on our hearts. We We adore adore you because you are good, you are kind, and you are perfect. You do all things well. We know you as all-powerful, all-knowing, and ever-present. Thank you for being so loving and so forgiving. Without you, God, we can do nothing. But with you, God, we can do all things, and all things are possible. Thank you for bringing us to this moment in worship. Open Open the the ears of these, your people. I pray pray this message will lead all of us to action internally and externally as we continue this journey called life. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Amen. Amen. Joy in the test. In all of our lives, There are times when we are doing everything just as the Lord has commanded, but yet trials, tribulations, and troubles find us. Then there are times when we've been disobedient to the Lord's direction for our life, and we know it. We cry a little, then we confess our sin, and we pray, God, forgive us as promised in 1 John 1 and 9. Where it reads, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us of our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. I truly believe God forgives us every time we ask. But the problem is we are often not willing to forgive ourselves. At these times in our lives, we may be tempted to feel down, to feel depressed, to be upset and even angry. But James, the author of the text, suggests that the appropriate emotion is not depression, it's not anger, but it's joy. That's J-O-Y, joy. Upon the first reading of this passage of scripture, it would not be too out of order to say, Brother James must have been out of his mind or on some medicinal figs to believe that one should be appreciative, one should be grateful that all hell is breaking loose in their lives. I should get an amen right there. But the more life is lived for Christ and the more one reads, studies, and meditates on the Bible, a shift in your thinking is likely to occur that helps any of us and all of us to gain a different perspective on the statement, count it pure joy, which would imply that we should be ecstatic, we should be happy, we should be over the moon when trials and tribulations come our way. Here's what I know, the older you get, the more life you live, the better understanding you develop. I understand it better now that when my mother died many, many years ago, I could not die with her because I was able now to find joy in memories, joy in things that she once said, joy in how I look and act like her. So for a friend who lost her job due to downsizing but was able to find joy in the shakeup of her professional career because she understood that God was moving her in the direction of the thing that she had the most passion for. So here's what I believe this morning. There are probably at least a few of us who would be honest enough to admit that being joyful or rejoicing has not historically, nor is it currently, our first response when trials and tribulations come our way. I know being with joy or counting it joy is not my typical response. Somebody should say, I know that's right. If not for yourself, for me. Thank you, sir. 
I'm, I'm talking, talking to, to those of you who are trying their best to be obedient to the word of God. The Bible says to love your enemies and do your best to be pleasant and considerate. But those are the same people who show no appreciation nor reciprocation for you. The Bible instructs parents to train up a child in the way they should go. And when they are old, they will not depart from it. But you're in that in-between stage right now. So it's kind of hard to see that. I'm talking, I'm talking to, to the daddies, daddies and the strong male role models who are showing their sons and daughters and young men and women in their lives how real men would respect their women and how men should carry themselves appropriately. Or the mothers who are not solely interested in trying to be their young daughter's best friend and running partner, but they truly want to show their daughters the characteristics and traits of a well-respected and independent woman while working and living in a world where the worth of women is not only, is only tolerated and not celebrated. But let's pause for a minute and thank God for the confirmation of our sister Katanji Brown Jackson, the first black female Supreme Court Justice. Now, if that's not black girl magic, I don't know what it is. So we're grateful for that. Because, of all, because for all of us, in all of our best efforts to do the right thing, to try to be correct in our actions, in our responses, to make a full court press to respond in a fair and reasonable way, troubles and trials still find their way to our location. You can, you can identify your own personal scenario. It may be the untimely death of a loved one or the way, the way in which a loved one died or a friendship that dissolved without warning or a financial hardship that wipes what you thought was your nest egg or it could be a medical diagnosis you did not see coming. I believe that James is saying that even in the midst of it all, Consider it pure joy. And another version would say, count it all joy. So when you prayed and fasted and sought the Lord and still your situation goes into a downward spiral, count it all joy. Because God's word remains true. In Jeremiah 3, 33 and 3, he says, call to me and I will answer you. Show and show you great and mighty things which you do not know. When we've cried before the Lord until we are drained and there are no more tears to shed, we should consider it pure joy because weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. And nowhere does it tell us which morning. It just says it comes in the morning. Psalms 126 and 5 says, May those who sow in tears reap with shouts of joy. So to consider going through trials and tribulations of many kinds, pure joy, really is unfathomable to the flesh. It's an oxymoron because it certainly does not go together like peanut butter and jelly goes together. Cookies and ice cream, that goes together. Steak and potatoes, I'm sorry for the vegans in here, but steak and potatoes, that go together like ebony and ivory. Joy, Joy, by, by definition, definition, means a positive, positive attitude or pleasant emotions. emotions. Trials, Trials and tribulations, on the other hand, saints, means afflictions and troubles caused by persecution and severe testing. An affliction is a condition which causes suffering, distress, or pain to your body, your mind, or your spirit. Conditions like foreclosure, repossessions, loss of a job, unfavorable medical diagnosis, wayward children, mental disorders, it's those types of afflictions that are the polar opposite to creating a sense of joy in the midst, in the minds of people going through. Am I right about it? Amen. In order to have joy when the unfavorable happens, we must turn to the examples and help from the one who has been through more trials and afflictions than anyone on the earth, Jesus Christ. Jesus, our burden bearer. Jesus, our heavy load carer. Jesus, our great example. 1 Peter and 2 reminds us that even as he suffered on that old rugged cross, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to the one who judges justly. 
Jesus Christ knew persecution and severe testing. He bore all of our sins in his body on that tree so that we might die to sin and not from our sins. You see, Jesus knew that God always has a purpose in persecution. That's good for us to remember today. God always has a purpose in persecution. Jesus knew that his purpose in being persecuted was so that we, all of us, could have eternal life if we accepted him as our savior. Saints, God will use our trials and our tribulations for good if we follow the example of him who came before us. It doesn't matter the name of your trouble, your tribulation, or your source of pain. It might be cancer. It might be arthritis, diabetes, Alzheimer's, grief, sorrow, divorce, you name it. But Jesus has made a way out of no way for us to deal with it. We have to follow him all the way. Maybe your trial is on your job for the distress felt at being overlooked once again for a promotion when everybody knows you're the next in line. That's an affliction because it causes one to think about in their own mind and their self-esteem could go low. You can count it all joy when you believe and confess that our God shall supply all our needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. We know that if one door shuts, God is more than able to open another. Someone else's fervent prayers even today seem to have fallen on deaf ears. I don't know about you, but that is testing of one's faith. But consider it, pure joy, the word says, because the Bible says in Isaiah 55 and 8, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. God has a plan for you and for me to prosper us and not to harm us, but we've got to continue to trust him in the middle of it all. There are at least two reasons in this, in this selected passage of James for why we should consider it pure joy in the midst of tests, trials, and tribulations. The first reason we should consider it pure joy in the midst of trials is because it is a faith tester. Say faith tester. Thank you. Verse 3 in James 1 reads, Because you know the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Saints, troubles, trials, and tribulations are faith testers. There is a familiar passage in Hebrews 11.1. 1. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Bible scholar Kenneth Hagin in his book, Bible Faith Study, says that what God is simply telling us is that faith is laying down laying hold of the unseen realm of hope and bringing it into the realm of reality. The Apostle Paul, the Apostle Peter in 1 Peter 1 says, these trials are only to test our faith, to show that it is strong and pure. We want to show God we got a strong and pure faith. So by definition, a test is a means employed to examine, try, or prove a thing. Most of us are familiar with tests or being tested, be it in school, on the job, in our marriage, while dating, in our parenting, or while waiting in line at the grocery store. For those of us who still go to the grocery store, waiting in line is a test of all tests. I declare it is. When we think about a faith tester, our faith is being examined. We are being tried to act we are being tried to act on what we believe or have said we know as Christians to be true, such as when we feel deserted or alone because the man or woman we love does not love us back. We are being tried to walk in the truth that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. As hard as it may be for us today, Faith testing has been going on since the beginning of time, when Adam and Eve were in the garden. As you remember, God gave Adam the instruction to eat freely any fruit in the garden except the fruit from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. He told him, if you eat of this fruit, you shall surely die. 
sounds easy. He had dominion over every animal and creature created. We know the rest of the story. They couldn't resist the enemy, and the consequences was to be removed from the Garden of Eden. So the first Adam didn't fare well in the faith test. But praise be to God for God's grace and mercy because he provided a second Adam, Jesus Christ, who passed every test of faith that came his way. Jesus also had his faith put to test by the enemy. He was tested in the desert. Matthew 4 recalls Jesus was hungry after 40 days and 40 nights. And here's what happened. The enemy comes talking to him about bread because he knew Jesus' state of hunger. He knew that Jesus had been through what Jesus had been through and what Jesus had been without. Jesus passed the test by speaking the word of God clearly to the enemy when he said, man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Here's how I interpret this family, that every word that we know that is God's word, that is what we should lean on. If we say what God says about us, we can experience the joy factor even during trials and tribulations. If we say what God says about us, we can experience the joy factor in trials and tribulations. God says we are more than conquerors. That should give us joy. God says we can do everything through Christ who gives us strength. That should give us joy. God says we cannot be separated from God's love. That should give us joy. The Bible says we are established, anointed, and sealed by God. So when our faith appears to be tested, we can have joy because we know that the word of God, as stated in James 1 and 12, is true. Blessed is the man who endures temptation. For when he has been proved or when he has been tested, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. That's enough to count it all joy, to know that once we've been tested, once our faith has been proved, we will receive the crown of life, which has been promised to us as God's children and Jesus' brothers and sisters. We are here today because in spite of the first Adam shortcoming, the second Adam, Jesus Christ, passed all the tests with flying colors. To take a test or have a test administered to you is to determine how much you know of a subject that you've studied or been in for a while. So before the pandemic, my husband and I enrolled our son number three, Jermaine, in Taekwondo. He was currently a white belt, and we understood that after a set number of lessons, he will be tested to determine if he is prepared for the next level. Jermaine can't go on to the next level of yellow belt until the skills at white belt have been met, tried, and proven that he knows what he's doing. When he gets to the status of yellow belt, as his parents, we know the requirements will be a little more challenging. We also recognize he will likely complain that it's harder. But before each test, this is what we know, there will be a time of preparation. So, as, so it is in our own lives. I believe God wants to find out how much we really believe what he says in his words when storms come our way. Our periods of preparation include our devotional times, our Bible study times, services like this. But now it's testing time, faith testing time. He wants to know, God wants to know how much we really trust him with everything and everyone who is important to us. Here's what a friend told me that I've adopted for my own. God never commanded me or you to trust all people. God commanded us to love all people and to trust only him. Knowing the difference in that will help all of us in having joy and victory in some very trying situations. 
to have joy in the midst of trials, our faith must be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. If the truth is to be told, the one way to know that your faith is steadfast, immovable, always abounding is to have some trials, tribulations, and troubles enter into your life situation. You know, like I know, that if everything always went well, and we thought we had it going on, we wouldn't know the level of faith that we have. It's fair to surmise that faith-testing situations are designed for our growth and development. In these faith-testing situations, there is work for you and I to do. Because James also says in chapter 2, verse 26, that faith without works is dead. You see, my son Jermaine could have all the faith that he, that he wanted to to pass his Taekwondo colored belt test. But if he doesn't do the work by practicing and conditioning his body, his faith may not be enough. The same can be said for each of us. We have to not only study God's word, we have to live like we believe God's word. We, we must, must walk, walk out, out our faith. faith. A, a faith, faith tester is like being thrown to the lions because of your belief. In, in the, the book of Daniel, Daniel chapter 6, we find the segment of Daniel's life story when he is thrown in the lion's den for not obeying the king's decree. The, the decree was that you, did, you could not pray to any god except the king for 30 days. It was only 30 days. What could you do? While Daniel's haters were acting out of jealousy of his favor with the king, the underlying motive of the enemy was to test Daniel's faith. But Daniel proved the enemy wrong as he continued to pray three times a day to his God. As you read this account in Daniel chapter 6, the king who favored Daniel was compelled to carry out his directive. So he did so that he would not lose credibility. And as, he, as Daniel placed, was placed in the lion's den, the king said to Daniel, May your God, whom you worship continually, deliver you. So here's my statement to you. May your God, who you worship continually, deliver you. Listen, brothers and sisters, you can and should count it all joy in the midst of trials and tribulations because God can and will, according to his desires, send an angel to shut the mouth of your and my lions. Your lions may be a spirit of manipulation from a family member or a belligerent co-worker no one can seem to get along with or the boss, for those of us who are still working, that thinks micromanaging is the only way to manage or that failed investment that puts everything at risk. But this is where the test of your faith comes. If we will just learn and remember to worship God with our whole hearts, even during the difficult circumstances, he can change things for the better if he chooses to. It is only a faithful person who truly believes that God's sovereignty controls his or her circumstances. So the first reason we should consider it joy when we fall into various trials and tribulations is because it's a faith tester. The second reason that we are to have joy in the midst of trials because it produces and increases your fortitude. Fortitude, according to the dictionary, is the strength of mind allowing one to endure pain or adversity courageously. It's resilience. In other words, it's to persevere. James 1 and 4 says, perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. So when the company you worked for for the last 25 years decides to merge and your position is one that is no longer needed, this verse says to press on, to continue to pray. To, to, it says not to give up, not to throw in a towel, even though the pain seems unbearable. In spite of what our eyes tell us, we have to endure. We have to persevere. We have to face the adversity courageously. Because 1 Corinthians 2.9 says, declares that I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have it entered into the heart of man and woman the things God has prepared for those who love him. 
we can count it all joy, not be afraid nor give up because we trust him. He is with us and he will have the final word. Here's what I know. In the end, we win. Remember, what God promises, God performs, so persevere. Come here, Joseph, as another example, the oldest son of Rachel and Jacob's two boys, the favorite son of Jacob who was hated by his brothers. What do you know about perseverance and fortitude? I hear Joseph saying, it took perseverance to survive being sold into slavery by my brothers because of the dreams I shared with them. It took fortitude to know that the things God showed me in my dreams would not return to God void, even when I had to go to work for Potiphar. And then Potiphar entrusted me with everything in his household but his wife, and she decided to sexually harass me and then falsely accuse me so I was thrown into jail all because I was handsome come here somebody there are difficult times that come our way not because of anything we did but because of our determination to be in God's will because you and I are attractive in the sight of our heavenly father You can persevere. You can endure in your trials because God is with you. And here's what we know. If God be for you, who can be against you and succeed? That's great news this morning. Just because things are not going as you and I had envisioned them does not mean God is not with us. It does not mean that his relationship with us has changed. The Lord told Joshua in Joshua 1 and 5, and he tells us today, I will not leave you. I will not forsake you. He even added in Hebrews 11 and 13 and 5, I will never leave you. And because we know that the Lord will never leave us, never fail us, never forsake us, we can and we must stand firm, letting nothing move us, not trouble with our children, not trouble with our spouse or significant other, not tribulations with our finances, not a trial in our health, nor the chaos that continues to come our way. In other words, saints, when trouble comes, don't give, don't give the devil too much credit. Trials often often come so the work of God might be made manifested in us. And let's remember, it can only be manifested in us if we forget what is behind, but we strain toward what is ahead to press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called us into in Christ Jesus. Church, we've got to keep pressing so that perseverance will finish its work and that we may be mature and complete, lacking no good thing. We have to declare that we will not let the trials and tribulations that come our way because they will come our way, but we will not let them stop us from pursuing all God has for us. We will remember that joy is still available to us. Saints, don't give up. Don't give in. Don't, Don't let, let the, the enemy, enemy talk you into throwing in, into, in the, the towel. towel. God, God has, has not forgotten you. God, God has, has not forsaken you. God has not failed you. Let us consider it pure joy. joy. Let us count it all joy. Because our trials, our tribulations, our troubles can be and should be faith testers and fortitude producers. There is a greater one than us who came on the earth and whose faith was tested, but he fully complete and completely understood the assignment. He knew the promises of God. He knew that God the Father and he would persevere. His name is Jesus. He lived as our teacher of what it means to be tested. He died as our sacrifice so that if we persevered, we would not have to die the horrible death he did. He rose from the grave as our Savior so that through him and, and because of him, we can have eternal life. And because of Jesus the Christ, we can have joy in trials. We can have joy in tribulations because the kind of joy looks beyond the present to our future, salvation, and to our sovereign God who works out all things for our good. My time is up. I thank you for yours. God bless you and may heaven continue to smile upon you. I appreciate that. Now is that time where we can all participate.
What you're saying as the doors of the church are open, as the deacons and ministers do what they do here at Second Baptist by taking the house. If there is one who has yet to say yes to a relationship with Jesus, this is a good time. That's your first call. If there is one who has yet to say yes to a relationship with Jesus, if there is one who stands in the need of a church family, might I put a plug in? Pastor Hodge is a great pastor. Lady Hodge is a wonderful first lady. And this is a good church family to be a part of. So if you don't have a church home, this is a great place to be planted. If you've yet to say yes to Jesus as your Lord and Savior, here's your opportunity. She just opened the doors of the church. And maybe you are visiting with us virtually today. Just want to let you know that wherever you are, God, Jesus can save you wherever you are. You don't have to be in this building. But if you, have, if you, if you are seeking to know what it is to be able to have this joy, to be able to have this joy even in the midst of your trials, even in the midst of your tribulations. Jesus is the way. Simply by accepting him. Lastly, maybe you have strayed from the flock. Maybe you strayed from the fold. The Bible says that the Lord loves them. Backslide. It's not too late. I say to you, come back home. Come back home. Reverend Glennis, please dismiss Amen. us. Amen. It's our benediction. As you still stand, let's do our benediction. Now unto him who is able to keep you from falling, and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God, I say, to be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen. God bless you. Amen.